Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica Marquez, your host for today's episode. Many barriers stand in the way of a Latina interested in a career in STEM. From societal and familial norms to high school counselors telling Latinas and other women for that matter that maybe you'd be better suited majoring in something else. This has been the case for decades. Even if one pushes past the discrimination, there is still the challenge of a lack of resources, support, and the isolation of being the only. The numbers say it all. Only 2% of Latinas held science and engineering positions, as reported by the National Science Foundation, and that number hasn't changed in the last 5 to 10 years. But Latinas in academia, the workforce, and beyond are working to change that depressing data. In this episode, you'll meet Isaura Gaeta, Vice President of Security Research and General Manager of Intel Product and Assurance Security at Intel Corporation, who is leading by example in her respective field and sharing her story in order to encourage the next generation of Latinas in STEM. Isaura leads an engineering team focused on hardware security research. Previously, she was General Manager of Systems Engineering in the Platform Engineering Group and was responsible for optimizing engineering execution capacity, quality management systems, and operational excellence for a global engineering organization of 18,000 people. A 30-year veteran of Intel, Gaeta spent the first two decades of her Intel career developing various semiconductor processing technologies. Her work during that period led to two patents and five Intel Achievement Awards, the company's highest recognition. Gaeta holds a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. She founded Intel's Network of Executive Women for the Latin American region and was the chair of Intel's Hispanic Leadership Council. Outside of Intel, she serves on the board of the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley, where she chairs the Nominating and Governance Committee. The Hispanic IT Executive Council has recognized her six times on the top 100 Hispanic professionals in the IT industry. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the references in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Isaura. Welcome, Isaura. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you on. Um, I personally, because your story resonates so well um, with, you know, it's parallel to my life. And I think ultimately, all of our listeners will really love to enjoy your journey, your story, especially as a Latina, kind of, you know, the one, you know, very first electrical engineering Latina at Stanford and all of the stories of, you know, how you persevered and how now you are a senior leader and executive at Intel. So without further ado, can you please just share us a little bit about yourself and your journey and where you started? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. But I love the opportunity to share a little bit about my learnings. And hopefully along the way, this will resonate with some of you, and maybe there's some learnings that we can all take away, and uh, hopefully others won't have to struggle as much as I have to struggle. (laughs) Absolutely. All of your pearls of wisdom, I'm sure, will be snatched up by our listeners. Um, So tell us a little bit about your, your journey. How did you get started, and how did you, as a young, you know, Latina, think about engineering? Yes. So I was born in the United States, in Chicago. But mm-hmm. like a lot of immigrant families, I didn't learn how to speak English mm-hmm. until I started kindergarten. Yeah. And so math really resonated with me because it didn't matter that I didn't speak English. Mm. It just made sense. Uh-huh. And so throughout elementary school, I gravitated more into the mathematics. And then I found out about science. And I just loved those fields mm-hmm. at the time. I didn't have anybody in my family that could sort of point me to, what do you do 
if you're mm-hmm. interested in math and science. I was thinking, you know, a teacher or a doctor, those are the only two fields I was mm-hmm. aware of. But luckily, in high school, I started learning a little bit more about engineering. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to my high school counselor and saying that I wanted to go to Stanford and I wanted to study engineering. Mm-hmm. And finally, in that time, in the 70s, um, there was a lot of negative uh, kind of backlash, I think, in mm-hmm. terms of women going into these fields, and, mm, and especially right. as a Latina. So my high school counselor basically said, you'll never get into Stanford. And why don't you go into these other areas that are probably more suited for you? But there was a little voice inside of me that was very stubborn. Uh And I knew this was where I was interested to study math and science, electronics. And so I persisted. I wanted to sort of prove this counselor wrong Mm -hmm. that I could do it. So luckily, I was accepted into Stanford University, and I studied electrical engineering, Mm -hmm. and then I went on into semiconductor processing, which is a fascinating field because it combines physics and chemistry and mathematics and computer modeling, and you do experiments on silicon wafers, and the result is you create chips that go Mm -hmm. into computers, that go into devices that make our lives easier and better. And I think that's why I went into engineering is because Mm -hmm. it's about helping people. It's about making our lives better. That's that's fantastic. How I got into this. So you know, you know what you said. There was something you said that really resonated with me in terms of you know when you're growing up and you're younger, you have this limited frame of reference that you know how do you define success? And to you at the time, success was you become a teacher or you become a doctor. I think, you know, similarly myself, it was like you become a teacher, a doctor, um, you know, or in my case, I lived in West Texas and it was a big oil country. So it was like petroleum engineering was something. And so I, you know, I'm fascinated on how you, you know, found your way into the thinking about engineering. But as you said, when you started sharing your dream of going to Stanford and pursuing engineering, people were kind of telling you you couldn't do it. And so I'm sure that instilled some fear or some limiting beliefs that, you know, could you do this or not? What did you do to help kind of overcome those fears and limiting beliefs? Because I know you had a lot of determination and tenacity to kind of maybe prove people wrong. But in those moments when you had those doubts, how did you get past that? Yeah, so there's there's constant doubts. And I think, you know, even today as a successful professional, I still suffer from the imposter syndrome once Mm -hmm. in a while. Yes. And so you kind of have to ground yourself in, you know, at Stanford, I knew that going to Stanford, I was very well prepared based on my high school and the grades I had gotten. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind myself, yes, I belong here. (laughs) Yes, I can do this. This is what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So you have to quell those little voices that come in that sort of, tell you you're not good enough or you're not Mm -hmm. supposed to be here and you have to stand and say yes I am supposed to be here Mm -hmm. and so I I still do it to this day because that little voice sometimes tries to creep in and it's like no I have my credentials I have all this history of what I've achieved you know you have to sort of name it and say okay it's the imposter syndrome again be quiet and (laughs) you know let's keep going forward so I don't think I've mastered it. It's something that I still deal with, but uh, that's my my tip is to just kind of name it, put it aside, and just keep going forward. No, that's fantastic. I I usually tell myself, yeah, you name it, you put it in the back seat, and you tell it, I'm still driving. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you may be coming along for the ride, but you're not in the, you're not in shotgun. Um, that's fantastic. So being in Stanford and being first generation college, um, you know, thinking about how important community is, um, you know, did you, you know, how did you identify and build kind of some, you know, key lasting relationships? You know, how did you find community in a place where you were very much likely, and, you know, I'm making assumptions here, but based on, on research and history, you were probably one of the only. Um, tell me a little bit about that. What was that like? Yeah, it was actually very difficult when I first started Stanford because there were very few Latinos at the time, very few Latinas, especially in the engineering classes. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And although I was well prepared going in from high school, I did not come from a college prep high school. And so in my classes, you know, there were students who had already taken two years of calculus. And here I am, you know, just learning about a lot of these concepts. So initially, I'm kind of on my own, struggling, trying to understand. And I was introduced to the uh, Latino Chicano community at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And immediately it was a sense of family, a sense of I'm home, a sense of people that understand me that are going through something similar. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a group, the Stanford Society of Chicano and Latino Engineers and Scientists. Mm -hmm. and there was a, a junior at the time. He said, come to our meetings, learn what we do. And immediately it was like other pre-engineering students uh -huh. that were like me, that were, you know, first in their families to go to college, that were interested in this space of engineering. Mm -hmm. And immediately it was, it was very calming and very re reinforcing that, yes, I can do this and mm -hmm. very supportive. And so that's basically um, what really helped me make it through because mm -hmm. going into my individual classes, especially in electrical engineering, at, at the time, less than 5% were women. Oh, wow. And I think I was the only Latina because I didn't see any <laughs> uh -huh. until I was in grad school. Um, and so being, getting that lonely feeling while in the classes and, and, but then afterwards having this community of other engineers who are Latino and mechanical engineering, civil engineering, building that community. Eventually, um, I ran for president of that organization in my mm. senior year and Fantastic. not only having that community, but also the opportunity to learn leadership skills mm, to right. this organization move forward and and how do we engage externally how do we bring that next generation in how do we uh, involve industry and get internships and, and positions for our um, members that helped build tremendous uh, skills for me so I really credit the Latino community mm -hmm. at Stanford for helping me find my way and, and successfully graduate from the programs. That's fantastic. Now, I can imagine, like you said, um, you know, going into, an, you know, pursuing an engineering degree is extremely, you know, just rigorous. Um, so, thinking about making sure you were committed to your, you know, your coursework, your classwork, and then, of course, probably the, the labs and everything else and projects that you were doing. But then you took on this leadership role, kind of an extracurricular activity, per se, that really, to be quite honest, is probably like a second job. Um, what are some of the habits or rituals? Like, how did you balance that, you know, work and extracurricular um, and still be successful? What are some of the keys, the habits or rituals that were kind of the key to your success? Yeah, so, you know, I think I needed that opportunity within the, uh, the club, the, the group that we were in, mm -hmm. to sort of keep me going, because it, it would energize me, mm -hmm. and that would give me that energy to go back in the classes, and, you know, some of these engineering classes are, are very tough, because the concepts are, you know, very theoretical, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just knowing that um, I have this organization that that I'm part of, and they support me, and I can make it through it. So mm -hmm. it was a reinforcing uh, uh, area, having this organization. Um, and so I think it was really, you know, something within me also about not giving up that mm -hmm. persistence from a very young age of, you know, having people say, you know, you're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed mm -hmm. to study this. And that little voice saying, yes, you can do this. This is what you want to do. This is why you want to do it. Um, so that persistence kept me going as well as the community sort of reinforcing that, yes, I belong here. And I didn't want to let them down either. Right. <laughs> so I wanted to be successful too. Fantastic. So fast forward a little bit. Now you are entering the corporate world um, and you've, you know, you are, have been a successful leader at, at Intel. You've been there for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 25 plus years. Um, being first generation corporate, 
tell us a little bit about maybe some of the, you know, the, um, the setbacks or, you know, some of the, the challenges you faced being first time, you know, um, first time corporate and, you know, how did you get past some of those maybe setbacks that you um, experienced, you know, coming into especially a very male dominated industry and as well being a Latina? Yeah, so definitely, I think a lot of women engineers will will have this very similar story mm -hmm. where you come out of college, you're really excited, you're really well prepared, you go out and you're ready to start, you know, having an impact, and then suddenly it's kind of like, who's this, and, and who are you? And you get sort of these little uh, clues or cues that, you know, just do your work, kind of be quiet, you know, you, you, mm. you share your opinion sometimes and nobody says anything, but then the guy shares his opinion. It's like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's try that experiment. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very strange culture. I think a lot of the industry, especially the older industries, were created by men. And so that institution sort of reinforces a lot of behaviors that are traditionally masculine. Mm -hmm. And so my first reaction was to try to act very masculine, you know, wear slacks, try to be, you know, very direct, not, you know, smiling as much and just reporting my data. Mm -hmm. But it didn't feel natural. It didn't feel mm -hmm. natural at all. And so as I became more confident, I realized I could be myself mm -hmm. and still be very technical. So you have to kind of work your way through that, trying things you know, why isn't my voice being heard? Uh, finding allies that would sort of reinforce your point of view within the team. And the allies could be male or female. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, back then they were mostly male allies. Um, so learning little by little, you know, I, I had to learn it by myself because there really weren't a lot of people like me in mm -hmm. industry at the time. And so I would try something and it didn't work. I would try something else and just keep learning and growing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there wasn't anyone in my family that had navigated the corporate world mm -hmm. that could sort of guide me through this. Right. Um, and I think, again, a lot of the professional groups like the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, mm -hmm. which I was a part of, right. in those kind of events after work, you know, we could share stories and we could pick up tips and help each other and say, oh, why don't you try this? Or... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here's someone that might be able to guide you through this. So that was very helpful. But I, you know, for the most part, sort of stumbled along and somehow <laughs> managed to, to keep making progress. That's, that's um, really tangible advice in terms of, you know, just identifying allies or, you know, sponsors or mentors. Can you share a little bit about, you know, we get this, I get this question all the time with, you know, some of our some of our clients and when, you know, coaching them or talking them through and they talk about looking for mentors or sponsors that look like them. But in situations like yourself, sometimes in very male dominated, you know, organizations where there's not a lot of diversity and, you know, no gender diversity and then, you know, just ethnic diversity is even slimmer. Um, how did you gain access to influential leaders or to sponsors? How did you develop those relationships where they were kind of advocating for you as well? What I found, and this is true of networking, you give more than you get. Mm. When you are in a position where you're helping someone, you're providing data for a senior leader that's going to help them make their case, make their presentation. Um, you are available to, to do this experiment. Um, when, when you are that person they can count on, mm -hmm. suddenly that relationship, they know that uh, this is someone that really cares about the work that they're doing, that supports them, mm -hmm. and they're more than likely to then be a great sponsor for you. Mm -hmm. And that really, you know, in subtle ways, makes a big impact in your career. Uh, one of my sponsors, I didn't realize he was my sponsor until I thought about it years later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was in that role where I was the technical manager for a group. And I was, you know, basically he was the vice president of all of engineering at the time. And, you know, I was consistently meeting our deliverables, presenting data in a way that he could find useful. And 
when a position came up, he advocated for me. And it was a totally new role in a field that I hadn't been in before. Mm -hmm. When he first approached me, I basically said, oh, you know, I don't know anything about that area. And he was like, oh, you know, I'll buy you some books. You could learn. Um, And I was sort of like saying no to the opportunities (laughs) he was giving me. The next day he came back and he said, have you thought about it? Because I really want to announce you as the leader of this new initiative that we're starting. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually I said yes. And I, it was a very successful. I learned so much from this role. Mm-hmm. But he knew, he saw something in me that he believed I would be successful in this role in creating this new technology. Mm-hmm. And you know, when I look back, that's sponsorships. When someone's willing to take a risk and pull you up and 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 give you that kind of opportunity, and I I kind of think back that the reason he probably did that is because he knew that I was you know very consistent, high quality work, and mm-hmm. you know I had been supportive of of what he needed to do as well. So sometimes you don't even know uh, who your sponsors right. will be. But that's one way is to, you know, give more than you expect to get back. And that's my advice also for networking. Do you want to grow your impact as a change agent who ignites transformation in others, but you don't have a proven step-by-step method? Do you want to grow your visibility and influence as a thought leader to inspire others, but you don't know where to begin? The Beyond Barriers High Performance Executive Coach Certification is designed for experienced leaders who want to grow their impact and influence. Join this exclusive community of high achievers, advance your career as a leader, and experience the joy of helping others grow. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com and register for the webinar to learn more. Now, you mentioned something a little earlier that, you know, as you kind of stumbled through your early career and learning how to navigate the corporate culture, that you started gaining confidence and, you know, speaking up a little bit more, especially when you were in those meetings where maybe you voiced an idea and it got kind of glazed over and then somebody else repeats what you say. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's a great idea. How did you build your confidence? How did you, you know, as you, you know, as you started moving through your career, um, how did you build your confidence to where you weren't second guessing, taking opportunities like the one that your, you know, sponsor offered you and things like that, where you started feeling comfortable, where you were raising your own hand and not letting opportunities pass you by? Yeah, so I, I had to reconcile the fact that, you know, I was delivering results. I was completing my projects. We were getting things done. Mm -hmm. Um, Along the way, I received multiple awards for the technical innovation that we were doing. And so I had to, you know, stop and remind myself, you know your stuff. Mm -hmm. Do this. You know, your point is just as valid as the other guys in this room. Mm -hmm. So speak up. You know, I would hear some of their ideas and, and, you know, some of them are great ideas, but some of them were not. Mm -hmm. And so then it was kind of like, how can I not share this idea? Because this is what we need to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And so just reminding myself that uh, I did have information that was going to be valuable to share. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't share it, then we wouldn't make the progress we needed to make. So just over time, having that data Mm -hmm. to back up that, yes, my point of view is valid and I need to to share that. I love that because I think, you know, sometimes culturally, a lot of our, you know, with our Latino upbringing, sometimes we're told to be very, you know, to be modest, not to brag or self-promote. But I learned really quickly myself in, you know, the corporate space that just keeping my head down and working was not going to get me ahead. Um, So, how did you start to build kind of your personal brand and be able to kind of share your story and self-promote? Um, you know, can you give some tips on the best way to do that for those individuals who may be a little hesitant right now to kind of like, you know, toot their own horn a little bit? Yeah. And, and again, that's part of the learning. You know, when you, when you kind of start, you don't have any basis to, to feel comfortable to advocate for yourself. But as you start getting those proof points and you start uh, progressing in your career, banking on that and using that without bragging, you know, Mm -hmm. here's my data, here's my results, here's what I can deliver, how can I help you, I think I can do this for the organization, Um, 
being confident about sharing that and asking for what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, I want this uh, uh, opportunity to lead this team. I want this promotion because what I learned is that people can't read your mind. Right. You know, like you said, keep your head down, work really hard and, and good things will come. Yes, but it might be very slow. <laughs> you really <laughs> yeah. want to accelerate things. You have to speak up and, and say, this is what I want. This is what I think I can do. This is how I can help this company achieve mm -hmm. this. Um, so along the way, one of the things that, uh, since I'm working in the computer industry, mm -hmm. and one of the main products that we make at Intel is the CPU, the central processing unit, mm -hmm. the moniker that I developed for my brand is CPU. And that stands for commit, persist, and unite. Mm. So commit, commit to be your best self every day. When you show up, do your best, do your best work. Persist, persist despite setbacks, because there's going to be a lot of setbacks. Mm -hmm. Just keep going. And then unite, because you can't do this alone. You have to have a community. You have to have others around you for support supporting them. And that combination is, for me, sort of how I've been able to navigate my career as a CPU gal. That's fantastic. I love that. So the CPU, you're the CPU <laughs> gal. I love, I love that. But the commit, the persist, and unite. Um, tell me a little bit about, okay, you know, commitment is extremely important. And, you know, in the work that we do, we find that some of the biggest challenges that people have is um, maintaining that commitment, like setting and achieving certain professional goals or whatever it is that they're doing. How do you set your goals and how do you make sure that you, you know, stay committed to them and don't waver when you hit those setbacks? What, is, what are some tips that you can share that helps you keep pushing forward? So my frame of reference has usually been in like five-year increments. Mm -hmm. I'm not the type of person that when I first started, I would say, oh, someday I want to be a VP. Mm -hmm. I really didn't think that far. Mm -hmm. I was basically looking within my sphere of, what do I want to achieve next? And staying mm -hmm. focused on that. And when I got to that point, new areas would open up and that would be my next five-year plan. Mm -hmm. And so as a young engineer, in terms of wanting to grow, in terms of more impact, mm -hmm. more interesting projects, the next round was leading teams and starting to have an impact through others. Um, halfway through my career, I focused on my goal of having a family uh -huh. And I have three children who are all adults now. They all went into STEM fields and careers as well. <laughs> Amazing. Which I'm very proud of. Uh -huh. And then as my children were growing, then I started again refocusing um, on my career. Mm -hmm. I, as they got older, I had the ability to travel all over the world and have even bigger impact on the engineering teams uh, globally at Intel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now, basically, my, my next five-year plan, I would love to get onto a corporate board. Mm -hmm. So having sort of a shorter time frame, maybe mm -hmm. around five years, and then being very focused on what do I need to do for this next goal that I have? Mm -hmm. um, how do I prepare myself? How do I show up? Uh, what else do I need to do in order to, to get to that goal? And, and that's... That's been my plan is just smaller steps. Excellent. And, and I agree. I think sometimes when we do set that huge goal, sometimes it can be overwhelming and then you don't really take any steps forward because it's so daunting. But breaking it down into smaller steps and smaller goals is absolutely, the I would think, the easiest way to go forward. Now, thinking about your career in an industry that is, you know, there's always change. And just in this, you know, world, this digital age of things always changing. Um, how did you make sure that you stayed ahead of the curve in terms of staying up to speed on the new skills and competencies and, you know, techniques or just even the tech, you know, the tech world? How did you stay ahead? One of the things I love doing is reading. So mm -hmm. either reading what's happening in my field, what's happening in competitive industries. Mm. Um, and I do this every morning. I, I basically scan, like, what is the news in my industry? And I look some interesting articles just so that I can keep abreast of it. 
-hmm. In addition, I try to attend webinars or conferences or just different talks Mm -hmm. on other interesting topics. And that helps to, you know, kind of show you what other needs are out there. Mm -hmm. And as an engineer, you're always looking to solve problems. And so that's one way to really stay ahead of things is to, to just listen to what's happening out there you know, when COVID first hit, mm-hmm. I think the my immediate reaction was education. Mm-hmm. How are kids going to have access to technology, especially kids that don't have computers at home? Right. And so that was one of the immediate areas that, that I could foresee. We're going to be in this for a while, and we need to make sure that educational solutions are available, especially to our community. Latino kids may mm-hmm. have less access, less internet at home. And uh, the nonprofit that I sit on, we started having more conversations about that. Mm-hmm. So the, the way to stay kind of in the game is really constantly reading and keeping yourself in the know of mm-hmm. what's happening and then connecting the dots. You know, here's what I know about technology. Here's mm-hmm. some of the emerging needs. How do we, how do we connect the dots to mm-hmm. provide solutions and to stay competitive in this area? That's fantastic. I think it's lifelong learning. You never stop learning. And so that's how you stay ahead because the statistics are frightening. I mean, you know, one of the latest research said that, you know, skills become obsolete in less than 18 months. And so, and I'm sure even in, you know, in a place like Intel, it's even less than that in some cases because things keep changing and iterating. Um, Another question I had for you is, you know, given the fact that you have, you know, just outside looking in and you've seen kind of over the years, um, just, you know, as more Latinos and Latinas come into the tech industry, what are some of the challenges that you see that they are still facing um, that, you know, you want to create awareness around so that it's something that they know how to either one, be on the lookout for and know how to navigate it. But what are some of the trends that you see that, you know, you are, you hope that we will learn to kind of get over much quicker? Yeah. So there's numerous opportunities. I see them as opportunities. Uh There's challenges, but you know, how, how can we conquer these? Mm -hmm. Um, So, one of the things that we do not yet have enough of are Latino researchers. We don't have enough women mm. and underrepresented people in areas that are influencing the next generation of technology. Mm. And in order to prepare yourself for that, it's best to have a graduate degree. And, you know, for myself, I remember my, my first five-year goal was just get into a college uh-huh. um, and it wasn't until I was halfway through there that I found out that I could go for a master's degree. Mm-hmm. So we need to encourage our young people to, if they're interested and they have an opportunity to keep going, go for that master's degree, go for that PhD. That will position you in a, in a way to be able to work in these R&D roles where you're developing that next generation mm-hmm. technology. Artificial intelligence, for example, is going to be a, a life-changing uh, innovation. Mm-hmm. And if we don't have people of color working in creating the AI technology and the training and systems and the data that's used, mm-hmm. we, could, we could actually create a very biased data set. Yes. We need to have more people go into these advanced areas. And, you know, I see a lot of, students they they're you know so set on getting that bachelor's degree and going out in industry and that's great but some also need to to study further and come back and and be those entrepreneurs be those uh, phds creating that new technology that medical innovation Um, and so that's one of the opportunities that i see that we're not fully taking advantage of yet Um, the other opportunity is work within the community to to build each other up. There's groups like I mentioned, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineer, mm-hmm. Prospanica, a yeah. lot of organizations that uh, provide that kind of support network where with your peers, you can get that kind of information on how I can be successful. You can build that network. And also, if you take leadership roles in those organizations, those skills are mm-hmm. fungible back in your day job. 
Yes. If you're a leader of an organization like this and you, you know how to run a meeting and, and uh, create an agenda, fundraising, all those are portable skills mm -hmm. and that will only help you in your career. So those kind of opportunities, mm -hmm. I think we need to talk more to our young people about taking advantage of those. That's absolutely critical. And I think, you know, from, you know, my days at Goldman, um, I was fortunate that, you know, my team really started focusing on this concept of product inclusion, of how do you build for the world, and you really do need that diversity of thought on these teams. So I think, you know, what you've pointed out is extremely important in making sure that we're encouraging our community to, you know, pursue that, you know, those that higher education um, you know, that graduate education so that they can make sure that they're bringing the points of view and the perspectives of, you know, all of our communities and people because, um, like you said, the, the machine learning can be almost frightening if, like you said, it starts off with, with you know, just some systemic bias in it already. So, uh, I think those are some extremely important points and I appreciate you sharing those. Um, so, what one question we love to ask, the final question that we like to ask all of our podcast guests is thinking about um, women and women accelerating their success, especially in, you know, the digital age. Um, you know, you, you shared some of it already. I think you've answered that where you're saying, you know, keep continuously learning. But what else would you tell women to think about as they accelerate their success in the digital age? What are some of the key things that you think they need to do? Yeah, so embrace technology. Embrace mm -hmm. technology all around you. Uh, go into technology fields. Mm -hmm. um, it was traditionally very male-oriented. Mm -hmm. We need to change that in order to continue as a, as a society and make devices and products that are supporting everyone. We mm -hmm. need more women in these fields because we'll make choices that support how does uh, a female want this technology to work. Mm -hmm. um, without that voice, it won't be designed that way. Um, so don't be, um, don't be afraid of technology. Embrace mm -hmm. it, Embrace. learn about it, um, and go into, go into this area. First of all, for a selfish reason, because we need more. I don't want to be <laughs> among so few. Um, but then also, it's just going to make all of our product decisions and the technologies we develop even better. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, um, for being on the podcast with us. And if you, I'm sure our listeners are going to be, you know, excited to want to reach out and connect with you. What are the best ways for individuals to reach out to you and stay connected and learn from uh, your just your inspiring knowledge? Yes. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to look me up on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, just reference this podcast so I know uh, how you came to know about me. Mm -hmm. I'm on Twitter as well, Isaura Gaeta, and um, love to connect. And, and I'm just excited about the next generation and where you'll take us. So I'd love to stay connected. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Isaura. It's been a pleasure. And um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love your story. And it's so inspiring. It makes me just want to go out and do more. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there. And we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all resources for each show, including the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.